Hi, Clay, guest speaker for tonight. Uh, I, with the turnout of this crowd, I'm sure everybody knows who uh, Pat Dorsey is. And uh, again, fishing guide expert. And if you ever get a chance, uh, in fact, uh, one of the grand prizes in our raffle this year is a, um, a day on private water with uh, Pat. And uh, well, that's not my one. <laughs> no. So he's going to be talking about some of the uh, the local waters here and how you can go out there and and just have one of your best days on there. And he'll talk about you know some of his uh, worst guiding experiences. <laughs> Probably with me, my best, maybe with my wife, but. Uh, but anyways, I'll turn it over to Pat. Thank you. So this is what people are seeing obviously there and online. So it's good to do about this. So Well, we got through that. That's good. Stuff. And if you had to come over a little bit, remember the bag. That's right. Got my boundaries here. I get That's right. How's everybody doing? Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming out this evening allowing me to share my passion about uh, streams in Colorado. It's, uh, it's a wonderful state, as you all know, whether you've you know, been raised here or if you were you know, new to the area, it's, it's a pretty special place. It's a huge undertaking to try to talk about Colorado's best trout streams in 50 minutes, but I want to give you some sort of an overview of fly selection, match in the hatch, and then share some of those uh, favorite uh, places that I enjoy fishing so much. So let's get this party started here. I was born and raised in Colorado, and I caught my first fish in Gunnison Valley when I was 10 years old. I was blessed to have a father that was very passionate about fly fishing. He took me under his wing at a very early age and taught me all the nuances about fly fishing. I was also extremely fortunate to have a uncle that taught me how to tie my first fly. My father and my uncle had no idea where this passion was headed. It's like a pretty serious addiction to fly time and fly fishing. But the good news is, is I just started my 30th year as a professional guide. That's far from the world. So I made a living doing what I love, and that's really, really special. But as a young man, I knew there was something special about Colorado. Colorado has 9,000 streams, 9,000 miles of streams, of which 322 of those are designated as cold metal. And we all know that's a very prestigious designation at 60 pounds of trout per acre, with 12 or more of those being over 14 inches. Colorado is known for its wonderful fishing, and so many people enjoy coming to the Centennial State because of the legendary three stones like the Rowan Fort, the Guns in the Arkansas, and so many others, as well as our world-class tailwaters. And I think that's what really separates our state from the crowd, is our legendary tailwater fishing that's on everybody's bucket list. So let's talk a little bit about fly selection. I think fly selection is probably is one of the most intimidating parts of our sport. I think everybody would agree with me on that, that when you're catching fish and you have confidence in what you're doing, 
everything is good. But once you lose that confidence and you challenge yourself, I don't have the right fly, and potentially there's a guide across the way that's catching more fish than you, or a guide that's doing really well. If you lose that confidence, then your fishing suffers, so to speak. So I want to talk to you a little bit about entomology, just a crash course. Obviously, if you're going to be fishing, our tailwaters in particular, you're going to want to familiarize yourself with the life cycle of a midge. Midges are very, very important. We see three to five broods per calendar year. So us as fly fishers, we should familiarize ourselves with the larva, which look like little segmented tubes, the pupa, which has a robust thorax, which contains the wings and the legs of the adult, and then of course the adult. We need to come to the river prepared to imitate the various stages of development on a non-stop basis because they hatch continuously day in and day out. A good, healthy trout stream will have upwards of 2,000 midge larvae per square meter. That's, that's a lot of larvae, and they become very, very important during flow fluctuations. Let's talk about some of the flies that I would uh, like to see um, and share with you. Typically larvae, we see larvae in our streams, typically in a pale olive and red and in kind of cream colors. Larva doesn't require any type of a sophisticated fishing approach. We typically will dead drift those larva, bouncing them along the substrate where the greatest concentrations are typically found. Where things get tricky is once a midge hatch becomes evident. In other words, once we start to see midges buzzing around, that's where we have to start fishing mid cock. Typically, your midge pupa are going to be shades of brown and black. Some of my favorites are going to be the top secret midge. You can see the wide size range there, 20 to a 26. Uh, GGB midge, Charlie Craven's bug, one of my favorites. And then just one of the most basic flies that I designed from South Platte River is the black. Just a little bit of thread and wire, a little bit of dove. The biggest mistake that most anglers make when they're fishing midge pupa is they fish with too much weight. Does that make sense? They're fishing below the fish. So typically like a size six split shot is really all you'll need. Once you determine hatches in progress and you start to see the fish feeding on the adults, and some of my favorite patterns include a mass midge, size 23, 26, parachute atoms in smaller sizes, 24 to 26, and the Griffith that, particularly in that high fish variation, it's a good locator fly if you're fishing a smaller fly behind it, and it's also good at high glare and bubble lines. Mayflies have no doubt been a heart and soul of fly fishing for as long as I can remember. And they're very, very important. And when you really think about it, we almost always have some sort of mayfly imitation on our end of our tippet. Mayflies typically live about 364 days of their life as a nymph, and then they're going to be a, an adult for 28 to 48 hours. They'll turn into a little dun. And for as long as I can remember, everybody's explained the dun as looking like a little sailboat. While well, it's been used over and over again to explain its appearance best, it still is the best, no doubt about it. They're not sexually mature, so they'll fly to streamside foliage and then they'll turn into a spinner and they'll come back to the stream and they'll lay their eggs. And some of those spinner falls can be quite epic in Colorado. Let's take a look at some of the, the flies that you might want to consider. If you look up on the top right here, if you're a minimalist and you wanted to carry two mayfly nymphs, in your fly box. So if you carry pheasant tails and hares ears in a wide range of sizes, you can imitate any mayfly anywhere on the planet. That's what's amazing about those two flies. Hares ears, you know, up to a size 12 is a great green grape. Even smaller stone flies, all the way down to 18s for smaller mayflies. Pheasant tail works a little bit better for some of the thinner and sparser varieties of our mayflies, but those two patterns are must haves. Charlie Craven's Juju Pins, again. It's a pattern that you need to have. Typically when you're dealing with your betas, your spring mayflies are gonna be one to two sizes bigger than your fall mayflies. So you'll need to adjust your sizes accordingly. Style cups betas, another one of my favorite mayfly nymphs, size 22 predominantly. As far as the mergers are concerned, RS2. You know, we're, we're fortunate that we live in the hot bits or some of the, the best fly tires in the world live in the Denver area and have designed flies for this particular area and the South Platte. The foam wing emerger is a great little mayfly emerger. Talk a little bit about some of the, the uh, adult parachute atom surfaces again in larger sizes. 
all the way up to a 12. Greg Matthews hit it out of the park with this one right here. If I had to choose one pattern for mayflies, it would be this one right here. Change the shuck, change the color of the body, and the size, you can imitate just about anything. Shane Stout Cup CDC by a comparison is another one of my favorites, particularly for the trico hatches. Oh, not sure what happened there. Get your that's the cursor thing again. I'll do this. Oh, that into here. Just like when you got the presentation. Let's get the end of that. So. I can't, I can't yeah, get exactly. it out of there. I mean, I got flip back to this presentation. <laughs> and get into the oh, okay. How did you get back to the presentation? How can you bring up other? But it's not allowed to do that right now. Yeah, for some reason. Yeah. I don't know why it's back, but we're back. Don't move. Don't move. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what caused it to do that. <laughs> Let's move on to the next. Now this isn't working. Oh no. What happened? Did we lose it? Can you advance it? Uh, I think so. Let me talk about this slide okay. first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we're having a few bumps on the road here, but now we're the caddis. So, uh, caddis are obviously very important, predominantly on our freestone stream. We've all heard the famous Monday Bay Caddis Hatch, and it occurs in mid May. So let me get my uh, water here. So, for us as fly fishers, we want to familiarize ourselves with the three different larvae, which is going to be the brachycentris, which is going to constitute that Mother's Day caddis hatch, uh, the free living, and then the net spinners, which are the high growth cycle. So those are the three larvae that we should familiarize ourselves with. The biggest difference in appearance and behavior occurs with the larvae. All of the pupa and all of the adult look very, very similar. Um, doing good. So let's talk about the larva. Murphy caddis, great little brachycentris indication. The buckskin, this is an oldie but a goodie, invented on the South Platte back in the early 70s. This is a pattern that you cannot live without in Colorado. Whether you're fishing a freestone or you're fishing a tailwater, it's a must have, particularly in a side 18. And then a hydropsyche that's going to imitate the net spin. That's again, very, very important part of fly selection of caddis. As far as the pupa is concerned, the bread crust is one of my favorites. It's a pattern that came from Pennsylvania back in the Pocono Mountains. This pattern here, Gary Lafon came to spark the pupa. This is the man that literally wrote the book on caddis flies. This is a good pattern to have both in tan and in olive. And if I had to pick one pupa 
it would be Mars graphic cabinets. I carry the tan, which is kind of more of a gray color, and an olive. Sometimes I'll fish two of these at a time. That's how effective that pattern can be. With regard to adults, healthcare caddis, bond food or boss caddis, and then the goddard caddis. Those are my three. I'm very traditional with my caddis representations. Typically, either dead drift them or I'll skitter them. A lot of times, if I'm not getting the results that I'm looking for with a dead drifted caddis, then I'll try to impart some action into them. And you typically get an explosive rise form at that point. So we move into stoneflies, they're the easiest of all aquatic insects to imitate because they're available to the trout in only two stages of the life. The prehistoric looking nymph and then you pick the, the fluttering adult. So stoneflies typically, there's four different varieties we should familiarize ourselves with. The winter stone, which is really prevalent right now. If you're in places like the North Fork of the South Platte or up on the Yampa, you'll see black stoneflies crawling on the snow. We'll talk about that in a minute. Predominant stonefly in June and July is going to be your yellow sally. Those live one year in duration. And then the larger varieties are going to be your golden stonefly and then your salmon. Uh, Tarn narcissus stonefly. So emergence occurs on land, not in the water like other aquatic insects. But typically, there's a migration of all these nymphs moving to the river's edge. And that's when the nymphing is going to be very, very good with stonefly nymphs. Some of my favorites, Oliver Edwards. I'm sure Brian, you still carry that one, don't you? That's a, that's a good one. Get that in your the store there. Um, that's my favorite yellow salad nymph. Greg Garcia's mini hot or a yellow stimulator would be two good options for the yellow salad adult. As far as the golden stone flies, size 10 is the sweet spot. A lot of good varieties out there. You have the golden stone, the tongue stones. Um, you've got just woven stuff, thick pack of hash, these fly again, uh, all in size 10. It's really what, where you want to be. And then Amy's aunt. Is bar none is my favorite stonefly adult. I've caught so many fish on this particular fly. It's mind boggling. Definitely want to carry that in your arsenal of flies. Pat's rubber leg in brown, brown and black, and black in wide range of sizes, six to 10. This is a pattern I came up with a few years ago called the paper tiger, but it takes a lot of time to tie it. When you lose one of those, you get pretty sad about it, actually. It takes about 15 minutes to tie it. And then Clark Stonefly for the Terranarsis for the salmon fly hatch. That's my favorite with regard to the adult. A few other things to consider, some other food organisms. Definitely scuds, particularly in our tailwater environments. Carry them in orange, carry them in tan, carry them in olive in sizes 12 to 18. Nothing fancy about scuds. They start as small scuds and end as big scuds. Eggs, you want to have some eggs in the shoulder season. We fish a lot of egg bitch combos, egg beta combos in the spring and the fall. Obviously, if you fish three reservoirs, the blue, the tailor, and the frying pan, the tail races below those, you're going to need a mice shrimp pattern, 18s and 20s on that. Leeches, leeches are, I think, a very, very important food organism and more popular than ever right now. One of my favorites is the fine squirrel leech. Landed leech is very good as well. Uh, some aquatic worms and, and, and chamois leeches. I typically will fish these during the high water season. Pink and red worms when the water is stained, earthworm brown when the water is high and clear. This is one of the most overlooked food organisms of all time, I think. And it's out of sight, out of mind, because people just don't think about crane flies. But if you flip over a rock down the deckers, it's amazing how many crane flies are down there. And then Richard Pulaski, longtime friend, got their chapter. His Colorado Crystal Beetle is a pattern that you can't live without. Provides more bang for the buck, as well as hoppers and ants. Then one of my favorite things is unmatching the hatch. So later summer and in the opt you know, autumn season, just unmatching the hatch. And no fly selection is complete without a few streamers in your arsenal. So make sure you have plenty of streamers when you show up to Colorado. <laughs> okay, we're going to. Take our tour now through the Centennial State. And you know, um, Cheeseman Canyon is really special to me. I think we all know that. And that's that's why I'm starting out with Cheeseman. I always tell everybody, if I had one day left to fish, I'd fish in Cheeseman Canyon. That's, it's, a, it's an amazing fishery. It's one of the most technically challenging, humbling trout fisheries that I've ever fished in my life. And, and to be able to guide it is one of the most rewarding things that, that I've ever done. 
I can honestly say that Cheeseman Canyon has really shaped me as a fly fisherman. Uh, I've learned more by not catching fish in Cheeseman Canyon, and it's really taught me how to elevate my game to the next level. So if you're new to Colorado, we're talking about the flagship reservoir. Um, Cheeseman Reservoir was built in 1905, and it's three and a half miles downstream from Cheeseman Reservoir. Back in 1927, the Denver Water Board put this reservoir in place with 327,000 people living in Denver, and they thought this was going to be enough water to sustain the Denver metropolitan area. Little did we know we'd have six dams later and still have a shortage of water. But it is one of the most amazing fisheries you could ever set foot into. Put your backpack on, put all your gear in, hike in. Obviously, the further that you hike away, the less people that you're going to typically encounter. It's been catch and release since 1972. It's a self sustaining population of green bows and brown trout. And what's really special about this place is that you can catch fish from young of the year all the way up to fish that are over 20 inches, which is really, really amazing. Um, it's just a super, super special place. There's a common belief among South Flat regulars that this is a subspecies of its own. It's one of the most beautiful, beautiful trout that I've ever caught. We all know that March and April are two of the snowiest months in Colorado. Days like this here, these are the days dry flies, these dreams are made in this type of weather right here because it stalls the development of the mayfly guns and it keeps them on the water longer. So these are the days you want to call them sick because you're going to find all the hatches that are really, really amazing. Bright sunny days, obviously the olives are going to still come off of the dry fly fishing is not going to be as good, but the sight fishing can be very, very good under those conditions. Classic ripple run, pool tail out, like I said, it's just incredible opportunities to catch uh, just a mixed bag of wild mangoes and brown trout. I would put this fishery up in just about any fishery anywhere in the western United States. When you really look at a biomass of wild trout, it, it's really a special, special place. So much of it is because of the way that the Denver Water Board manages this fishery. You can see here, this is a full pool. We've got a classic bottom release tail water here. We've got water coming out of the jet valve, which is 60 feet below the full pool. So Denver water can actually warm the water up by bringing water out of the jet valve, which is an amazing concept. And then of course that full pool or spill over spill. I think we're at about 75% of capacity now, so we have a little bit of ways to go. The high water season tends to spook a lot of people. They, they get a little bit worked up about the high water season. But I'm here to tell you, it's the best time of year to be in Cheeseman Canyon, May and June, because of these scuds that you'll see right here, these big Vermeer scuds. The scud bite is one of the most special times, the most amazing dip fishing that I think you'll encounter in the canyon. I call this the stupid period. We all know that the fish can be difficult to catch, but during the high water season, they are a lot more forgiving and a lot easier to catch. You can see the flow here is about 1,500. The sweet spot in the canyon is 250 to 500. So this is quite a bit higher, but notice how clear the water is. And it still fishes very, very good. When it gets back down off the spillway, then that's when we start to see uh, more of our traditional hatches. We start to see the PMDs, we start to see the caddis. Keep in mind the caddis are delayed well into the summer months on your bottom release tailwaters, but this is when the sight fishing and opportunities like this exist. Big fish like this don't, it's not to happen by accident. It's when everything comes together, choosing the right fly, fishing the right water, sight fishing and so on and so forth. And I'm not a numbers guy, but when you bring a fish to hand, it does fluctuate if you're doing things correctly. You can wet wade in there, obviously it's, it's placed and you gotta watch out for some poison ivy, but there's really not a lot of snakes or other harmful things in there that you gotta worry about. So. It is uh, an enjoyable place to wet wave when the water's coming up the top. It can be very cold when it's coming off the bottom. My favorite time of year is the trigones, no doubt. It'll bring some of the wariest and some of the craftiest fish to the surface to feed on dry flies. Moving downstream to Deckers. I know everybody loves Deckers. I love Deckers. And it sounds like there was people, CJ was down there, the fellow over here was down there. It's a technically challenging fishery, but for me growing up, it was just going fishing and I had to learn how to catch those fish. But we're blessed to have the Deckers area. And we're talking about this section down here and then down, there's several miles. And the question always is, when does the tailwater quit becoming the tailwater? 
And so I typically say, you know, 10 to 13 miles below the dam is where you're going to experience your true tailwater characteristics. But the lower river, you definitely get some, some good fishing, but the aquatic life becomes bigger and more diversified as you move downstream. In last month's uh, issue of uh, Fly Fisherman, I wrote a story called Hit the Deck. I'm not sure if anybody saw that article or not, but it was, um, Ross Pinnell asked me to write an article on it. And uh, I had mixed feelings, of course, but I thought I was going to get a lot of death threats on that <laughs> article. But um, anyways, I read the article. This is the opening spread for that article. And uh, we're so blessed to have this in our own backyard and to be able to go down and catch these beautiful fish an hour from where we live. It's interesting, the Deckers area has gone through an amazing transition over the last few years. Cheatham Canyon has about 5,000 fish per mile. Deckers, depending upon the location, has anywhere between 4,200 and 9,000 fish per mile. About 25% of them are these larger rainbows. But the biggest change that's going on at Deckers right now is the population is about 76% brown trout. Anybody that's fished it, you probably noticed that your catch, catch rates have really changed over the last few years. So I got the electroshocking data from Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and, and I, I saw this. The lower station said 9,200 fish per mile. And I asked the biologist, I said, is this some kind of a joke? He said, no. He said, I said, I knew there was a lot of brown trout in there, and my catch rates have been you know, 80% brown trout which punctuates that the electroshocking data is dead on. So um, we've had several low water years and um, it's allowed those brown trout to propagate. It's just a great fishery. You can target these spots like this, stay away from the bass currents, tar target the soft water margins and fish a lot of uh, midge patterns. Um, look at uh, this picture of my lovely bride here and this beautiful brown trout. And that's, that's what it's really all about now. It's just the way that this fishery that was once a rainbow trout fishery has swung over to this remarkable brown trout fishery. And the brown trout now are out competing the rainbow. So in my humble opinion, I think it's going to be difficult to get the rainbow trout reestablished in this particular section of the river. But I'm okay with catching nice brown trout like this. And I know everybody in this room is as well. And so there's, there's all kinds of access, as you all know. Uh, this is up around the uh, Lone Rock Campground area. You know, Lone Rock Campground down the Bridge Crossing is going to be my favorite section. And some of those bigger rainbows typically are going to be found up in that Lone Rock up to March 1 area right in there because you have some of those that are sliding down from the private wells. The Gunnison River, as I mentioned, hopefully I'm not getting too long winded here. The Gunnison River, um, special to me because that's where I caught my first fish with my father. And you know, it's, it's uh, an amazing river. It begins up in the small community of Almont, where you have the East River and Taylor River combining forces. And then you have a beautiful tree stone that empties into uh, Blue Mesa Reservoir, which is the biggest reservoir in our state. Uh, think about Gunnison River and any other tree stone is they're challenging because they're consistently inconsistent. Does that make sense? Because for the rain shower, they turn white. They freeze during the winter. Patches are very sporadic. So they're very, very difficult at times. But I love them for that reason. And I love the governor's reason for this reason. Because my wife and I got married in my drift boat <laughs> 20 years ago. So my wife and I are going to renew our vows this year on the Gunnison River on Memorial Day weekend, flying with my best man, and my mom's. And Jim Cat is coming back, and we're going to redo it all over again, which is pretty darn cool. So we go back over Memorial Day, we celebrate our family, all the fun times that we've had, uh, you know, since childhood. And, and, and our, uh, you know, our wedding, of course, is, is the main event over that holiday weekend. But it's typically on the onset of runoff. So a little color never hurts anything, as this picture right here. Sometimes a little discoloration can be your friend. Kim and I will fish the Gunnison all the way through runoff. The flow here is 3,300 CFS. You can see it's clear out of its banks, but it can be very good fishing. Typically late June is when things really start to shape up in the Gunnison Valley, starting with the green gray catch. If you've never caught a green gray catch on the Gunnison River, you should mark that in your calendar. This is bucket list stuff here. It's amazing. It moves up river slightly every day, being in the right place at the right time. 
you'll have a fantastic result with ring drags. If you're lagging behind it or if you're out in front of it, you'll wonder what all the hype is about. And it'll bring some very large fish to the surface during the height of green drag catch. It's really, really amazing. I grew up fishing with a lot of tractors. Just your, your, your standard stuff. This fly right here is my dad's favorite, the renegade. He taught me that, um, the importance of that fly early on. But just humpies, wolves. I invented the line bait for the gunnison uh, just so he could see it from a drip boat in high glare situations. Something that floated high and fished, you know, very, very high in those currents. So, um, you know, Kim and I have been really blessed. We've raised five kids and we've raised them in the outdoors. And Hunter, he's really turned in to be a good angler. My son, Forrest, and even our daughter loves it. So it's so cool that we can just really embrace fly fishing in the outdoors and spend all that wonderful time in the Gunnison Valley. My good buddy, Jason Booth here, Dr. Adams. Dr. Adams has helped me uh, a lot of my photography and my books and so on and so forth. And just a good guy. But fall is a special time over in the Gunnison Valley. Typically about the 10th of August, we start to see these little silver bullets show up. I'm not sure how many people have ever caught a coconut salmon on fly, but it's a hoot. Um, they'll eat any brightly colored flies, sandalone worms, you know, pink ones, bright eggs, and just a variety of nymphs. Um, so that's really fun. And then prime time anywhere in Colorado is typically going to be late September, moving into October. Peak colors are usually around the 27th to 30th, and fishing remains good even after the leaves have dropped. The Gunnison Valley during the fall is just such a, such a special place. Toss said the migratory component of round trout moving up out of uh, Blue Mesa Reservoir into the Gunnison, combined with the Kokanee salmon, and you can see the transformation that occurs over a four to six week period. They look like their cousins in Alaska or up in British Columbia. They build reds. They don't successfully spawn, but the rainbow trout come in behind those spawning areas and they eat on eggs. So very, very fun time of year. If you've never been into the Gunnison Gorge, I would highly recommend it. It's one of the most um, thrilling experiences that I've ever encountered in my life. I had the opportunity to go in there and uh, as luck would have it, my wife and I got to fish with Shelly Walchak who wrote a book called 52 Rivers. She's a librarian and she took a sabbatical, a one-year sabbatical and wrote this book on uh, fish a different river every week. So that was really cool. Got the opportunity to fish with Josh Bronson um, and experience what the Black Canyon of the Gunnison is all about. It's uh, an amazing stonefly river, as many of you know. Typically, guys like Josh get booked a year out because of uh, the wonderful stonefly nymphs and the adults that hatch typically during the first week of June. The stonefly hatch is one of those things that, again, if you hit it dead on, it's one of the most amazing things you'll ever experience in your life. If you miss it, it's one of the most disappointing things you'll ever. And I can tell you this, you can hit it on June 5th and then you can go back to the lodge and you say, I want to book it for June 5th next year. It's not that easy. It's either a few days late, a few days early, so it can be very, very difficult. But during that time frame, there's the sparks, stone, uh, it'll bring some big fish to the surface. Typically your um, salmon flies come off first, the fish will continue to look up for a week or two. Then the golden stone flies come off and you have some exceptionally good dry fly fishing with golden stone flies. And then the hopper season will keep things as far as the surface activity kind of fired up until the uh, middle to latter part of August. Talk a little bit about lysis. Um, lysis mania, you know, the tail of the blue and the frying pan rivers, three places that you look Looking to find a trophy trout, this would be a place that you might want to investigate a little bit more closely. You'll look at this photograph here. These are some of my favorite shrimp patterns. When shrimp are in the water and living, they are clear. And when they hit moving water, they die. So living shrimp are clear like this, epoxy, and then white shrimp will imitate the dead ones. You can see that one of the most important attributes to a lysis shrimp is gonna be the eyeball, very, very important. The Taylor River, I went over and did a talk for the Sockeyes, um, which is the fishing club over at Western State College. And this particular day, it was 20 below zero in the Gunnison Valley. And my buddy, John Peeple over in Iowa, and I was able to capture this photograph here. It's a beautiful photograph, but it was absolutely 
freezing. But there's plenty of nice days, bluebird days like this one here, where you have the opportunity to target some very, very big fish to get fat on mice and shrimp. It's important to know that the most shrimp that exit the dam come out during the high water time frame. So when there's great destruction of the dam, there's going to be more shrimp in the tail race. But when there is a shortfall of shrimp, then they just become tail water trout. So you're going to fish with standard fishes and make flies and so on and so forth. But lovely assortment of pocket water, ripple run pool tailouts. This particular section is referred to as the hog pen. And there are some amazing brown trout and some amazing rainbows to be caught in this particular section. A good buddy, Landon Mayer here, sight fishing, uh, no doubt one of the finest anglers that I've ever had an opportunity to fish with. And this is the type of fish that one might expect to catch in Alaska right here. And watching this whole thing uh, unfold was pretty, pretty cool. Don't forget about the lower tailor. I know we're going to stray away for a couple slides here, but you know, I talked about the green gray catch on the Gunnison. The Taylor, I grew up fishing with my father, and it has one of the best green gray catches anywhere in this state. To bring a box of grapes and go experience that typically starts about the 20th of July, and you'll have some really, really good dry fly opportunities. Back to Mises, moving 60 miles due west of Denver, we have the Blue River. Uh, the Blue River has lost its gold medal designation in every section with that of the silver thorn area. So the four miles in silver thorn still is designated as a gold metal trout stream. And as we all know, it's kind of a unique fishery, certainly. You got the Ford dealership over there, you got Wendy's over there, you got all the factory outlet stores. Once you get past that, you can really key in on some of these beautiful rainbow trout. Again, you know, red larva, mice shrimp, good meat flies, and then just trailing some small fishes and main flies. But there are some opportunities to catch some very very nice fish in and around that silver thorn area and there's so many other things you can ski for half a day fish for half a day in the summer you can mountain bike you can hike there's so many things that evolve around this over on the frying pan river uh, is another legendary tailwater that's known for its big fish and the mice and shrimp picture of will stands with a big fish and will i think has one of the best patterns it's called sands mysis that you can see in this rainbow trout right here. Very, very nice fat fish. So make sure you have plenty of little sands patterns in your box. Uh, this is Joe Schaefer, uh, one of our guys at the Blue Coil Angler. He invented a fly called Beanie's Mysis, which is no doubt one of my favorite Mysis patterns as well. No doubt the best time to be a uni tail water. Like if you want to have deckers to yourself, go down on this Thursday. These types of days right here, Fish in this inclement weather, and a lot of times I enjoy guiding in days like this because you can definitely escape the crowds. Green stream is hard to be talk about, you know, Colorado fisheries without referring to the green stream. We're talking about the uh, world renowned section here between Spinney Mountain Reservoir and 11 Mile Reservoir. You have a resident population of fish as well as a migratory component to this fishery here. So very reminiscent of a Montana Spring Creek. It sits at about 8,600 feet. It's tucked in between the Salach and the Rampart Range. This often forms a wind tunnel. So if you're not a fan of wind, this is probably not a place that you're gonna enjoy fishing because it blows out there a lot, particularly this time of year, probably the worst. So you're gonna find a mixed bag of rainbows, cut bows, cutthroats, and brown trout. This is a humpback brown. So this is coming out 11 mile during the summer. See how big that fish is, very, very nice fish. The bulk of the fish in the green stream are gonna be these cut bows They're between 12 and 17 inches. These were put into the fishery by Colorado Parks and Wildlife to help, help um, combat you know, worthy disease, which has been a big problem in this particular section. They're very eager to rise the dry flies, they'll eat nymphs, they'll chase streamers, so they're a very angler friendly fish. High water season again, time, and I really enjoy this. High water is anything over 300. It'll fish decent up to about 500 CFS. But it's one of some of the bigger fish, the bigger browns, bigger resident fish. You're gonna feel a lot more comfortable. You're gonna be fishing bigger flies, bigger tippet, the hookup to landing ratio is gonna be much better during that time frame. You can see this is Spinney Mountain in the backdrop there, which was named after Ben Spinney, who was one of the first settlers in the area. Him and his buddy Samuel Hartzell owned all the land out there in South Park back in the day. Uh, this is one of the 
the little uh, Snake River cutthroats here, these are, I think, the real jewels of this fishery. They're not the norm, but every now and then, particularly this time of year, you'll catch more of these than any other time. So midsummer brings some really good dry fly fishing and nymphing, particularly with PMB nymphs. We're going to see caddis, we're going to see PMBs, we're going to see yellow sallies and trico. Um, that's very, very important. Um, the best fishing typically is always in the morning. So if you're going to err on one side or the other, as far as your day is concerned, Definitely get there early because you can see what happens in the sky right there. These big thunder boomers that move in, and you'll have some good fishing right up until the lightning starts bouncing in the hay fields, and that's when you know it's time to go. Probably the biggest claim to fame to this particular section of the river is going to be the migratory component, and that's what's going on right now. Typically, we start to see mid February through mid April, that's when we start to see fish moving out of 11 mile reservoir up into the South Platte to spawn, and that's when we start to see some very, very large fish show up. This is a 14 pound cut though right here that was pulled on size 22 pheasant tail. I was a little uh, worked up when I put this one on 6X. Uh, you'll see some pretty nice cut boats in to the system this time of year, as well as some very large rainbows. These fish move in and they move out very, very fast, just in an effort to spawn. In the fall, typically late September, uh, we start to see a migratory, um, you know, fish coming in. Starts with the uh, kokanee salmon, uh, much bigger in this particular section uh, in comparison to like the Blue River or in comparison to the Taylor and the Johnson Rivers. But these are big fish, sometimes up to you know 22 inches. They'll move in, they'll go through all the motions like we talked about on the Gunnison, and the brown trout will move in to capitalize on a high protein diet and then they'll begin to think about spawning themselves. And there's always that distinct possibility, like you saw with those rainbows, to catch a trophy brown trout. This one was close to 15 pounds. There's some big, big fish that swim into this stream. Talk a little bit about 11 Mile Canyon. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the section below 11 Mile Reservoir. Uh, because of the placement of the dam, there's only actually eight and a half miles of fishable access here. We're talking about the stretch between uh, Lake George uh, up to the reservoir itself. Don't forget about Happy Meadows down here, it's public access and Wildcat. Due to time restraints, we're not going to talk about those today. But at the top of these reservoir during the winter, it's challenging because you only get about a mile of fishable access because the cold water is obviously coming off the top of the reservoir during that time frame. So uh, this time of year, less water, but we're getting to that time when things are starting to warm up and unthaw, so the whole canyon will be fishable. It's one of those places that you can catch a fish on a dry fly for 365 days a year. Like other sections of the South Platte right now, we're experiencing a big spring mix, like these two, so with the upside your adults and upside your pupa limitations. But it's just a lovely stretch of water. It's got a mixed bag of rainbows, cut bows, and brown trout. About 3,500 fish per mile in that upper stretch between Springer Gulch and the dam. Uh, six campgrounds, forest flowed 96 parallels the river here, so it's a lot easier access to Cheeseman Canyon. It looks and feels a lot like Cheeseman Canyon, but the, the actual substrate is narrower. So a high flow in Cheeseman is going to be a really high flow in 11 mile canyon, if that makes sense. You have to kind of plan accordingly there. Just a nice mixed bag of fish, like I said, a lot of these open rainbows, they were put in 11 mile canyon to offset the uh, worthy disease as well. If you like the pocket water, I love pocket water because you're talking <coughs> less pressure fish. And a lot of times you can catch some of the bigger fish in pocket water. The thing about pocket water that I really like is that things happen faster. They can't sit there and count the ribs on their black beauty like they can in some of those pools. From there, everything happens fast and you can catch some really nice fish. Phenomenal dry fly fisheries, I mentioned, particularly during the summer, you got your caddis, you got your pale morning duns, um, shoulder seasons, you've got your olives, um, sallies, tricos, and you'll be able to catch just a lot of these cookie cutter rainbows like that with surface offerings. Beautiful brown trout that my good buddy Greg Blessing caught. A lot of this going on, some really, really technical dry fly fishing. That's what I really like about that. The hatch that I really come to appreciate in there is your trichos kind of fall. Typically, the duns come off about seven o'clock in the morning. Then the mating swarm forms about nine o'clock, and then you have the spinner fall that lasts for about two hours. Don't forget about hoppers, beetle ants, particularly on your downwind banks. Yampa, I love the Yampa. I got like three more rivers, and then we can answer questions. Are we good on time still? 
Um, Steamboat in Springs is a special place. We used to vacation there a little bit as well. And so we have um, a couple of different still water impoundments here. We've got Stage Trucks Reservoir and the tail water that comes out of there. Then we have Catamount uh, Lake, and you have a tail race that comes out of here going down to Chuck Lewis and then right into the um, Steamboat area. This is a top release tail race here, and this is the classic bottom release tail race there. But um, I'm going over there this weekend. I'm really excited. This is I try to go over and fish the gap of the migratory trout right around St. Patrick's Day. It's the best time to be over there. But uh, the, the, the lower uh, gap uh, looks and resembles more like that in a classic pre-stun stream like the Arkansas or the Gunnison or something like that. Um, but as you get closer to Stage Coast Reservoir, it does look and feel much more like a tailwater fishery. A robust population of bigger mayflies on the gap. So hares here, a pheasant tail are two good choices. This is a picture of Landon fishing right in town. You can see the 13th Street Bridge right there. But what makes this all work is these springs that come into the river and keep this section of water open during the winter in right through the town. So you can like go out and fish for a couple hours. You can see his pants are frozen there. It's pretty cold out there. But you can go in and warm up, grab a cheeseburger for lunch right in town and come back out and fish. It's a pretty cool place. This is what we're gonna do this weekend. We're gonna take a snowmobile into the section above Catamount. This is one of the coolest things. This is my good buddy, Steve Henderson here. And if you want to treat yourself to a wonderful day on the water, take snowmobile either into Stagecoach, which is pictured here, or go into that section above Catamount. And we really have a wonderful time sight fishing for some large rainbows that are moving upstream out of Catamount. It's just a special, special time of year. And occasionally you'll have an opportunity to catch big fish like this, 27 and a half inch. Cut lower. A good streamer fishing, you can see the ski area in the background there. Think about how many midges it takes for one streamer, one big bite. So sometimes just slowing down your retreat, fishing those traditional winter lies, you can get a nice opportunity to grab and find some big fish that are willing to um, chase the streamers. The Arkansas would be hard to talk about um, tail waters without talking about this particular section here. We're talking about the um, eight to 10 miles below um, Pueblo Reservoir there. And it's a uh, typically a banana belt, we all know that. You go south, it's typically warmer. You have a reservoir that's not as deep as many of our western tailwaters. And you can tell by the train that we're not in Stephen Canyon anymore. It's a lot different. You've got Russian olives, you've got cottonwoods, and kind of, um, you know, low gradient, but some really good fishing, all the same hatches that you would encounter on any other tailwater pretty much apply here, with the exception of things that are delayed later into the season. We'll see uh, blooming olives hatch sporadically all winter long. We'll see trichos into late November, early December. So it's a little bit different, but it's a great fishery and it's easy access to get to. Probably my favorite section is around the nature center. I typically hike at the nature center and then I hike my way up towards Balco Bridge. And they've done a lot of stream restoration in here, narrowed the channel down in certain places, um, put in some of these uh, weirs and cross veins, and they've made some boulder gardens and so on and so forth. But the fishing down there is pretty good. I think we all know and have probably fished this particular section quite a bit. And there are some chances to get some pretty nice fish. Brown trout definitely are uh, the minority of the species, but you will catch one here and there. But the bulk of the catch is going to be these beautiful rainbow trout. Colorado River. Uh, this starts on the back side of the Never Summer Range up near Rocky Mountain National Park and flows through the state of Colorado. Uh, the section that I really enjoy fishing uh, myself is going to be in and around the partial area there. And then you have a tailwater coming out of Williamsport Reservoir that has a profound effect on the fishery up in this particular section right here. During the winter, this section is frozen, but from the confluence down to a few miles, that section of the Colorado will stay open. So, like I said, it resembles more on the tailwater. But this is uh, the state wildlife area. There's the Kim Breeze unit, as well as the uh, BLM stretch uh, called Sunset Ranch. So you have plenty of public access in and around the partial area there, and with a predominantly a brown trout biomass there. Uh, and a few rainbows as well. And my favorite time of year, uh, in shadow of a doubt, is that fall season. I typically will fish it in the spring. I don't fish it as much during the summer because the mosquitoes are so bad over there because 
The ranchers irrigate the pasture land, so it's beautiful, it's really, really bad. Typically start fishing it again in late August. Um, the fall time, special time of year, the brown trout start moving. Uh, you know, in the fall, the browns get stupid because they're on the move, they're looking for areas to spawn. So that late September time frame, as you can see here, Fat Miles with beautiful fish. Uh, this is where we do uh, our float trips. As a guide service, we have three boats that we run down there, mini Board Canyon from Bo Pass to Radium. Uh, last picture is a picture of Bob Dyer, our head guide um, for our float trips. But uh, we put a lot of smiles on customers' faces over the years in this particular section. Uh, you have a few rainbow trout, a strong population of brown trout in here, as well as some white fish. But these are the real gems, particularly in the fall, trying to catch some of these above average size brown trout. I'm going to close it up with the Williams Fork. The Williams Fork is uh, a close second to one of my favorite fisheries. Uh, Cheeseman obviously holds a special place in my heart, but the Williams Fork does as well. I typically guide Cheeseman Canyon until the latter part of August, and then I switch gears and I spend the entire fall over fishing in this particular section of Middle Park. So this is the Williams Fork. This is the confluence of Colorado and the Williams Fork. And we have that migratory component once again that we talked about a few times. So we have big fish moving from the Colorado River into the Williams Fork in search of areas to spawn. This river is full bank to bank at 100 CFS. Anything over 300 CFS that's pictured in this photograph here is considered high. It's a fast gradient stream difficult to uh, wade at times, so I like that 100 CFS. It's just a sweet spot. Um, good friend of mine, Chris Wells, with beautiful brown trout. Um, just a robust population of brown trout, about 3,000 brown trout per mile in this small tailwater. Classic ripple bone, full tail out. It's probably the biggest challenge on this fishery is making sure that you have plenty of weight. If you go in there and fish with a BB, you're not going to catch any fish. You need to go in there with a cannonball down to those fish and you'll catch a lot of fish. That's the biggest tip that I can give you. But you catch a few of these Colorado River rainbows, predominantly Hopa rainbows in there, but every now and then you'll get some of those Colorado River rainbows. And the biggest part of the biomass, as I mentioned, is going to be these brown trout. In the fall, the average size will go up two or three inches and you'll have some opportunities to start seeing some of those bigger fish. It's a special time of year, particularly when the seasons collide, like this photograph here. I can remember my wife and I drove over that particular, it took us four hours to get to the river. And we got on the river and then the sun came out like we all see in Colorado and just quit snowing and it just turned into a beautiful day. And we had the river to ourselves, my friend John Keep over in this picture of my wife, Jim and I. So this, this is one of my favorite photographs I think that I've ever captured on that particular river. So special place. And I think, um, Obviously, due to time restraints, there's so many other rivers that we could have talked about, but we, we don't have time. We'll have to save it for another day. I think you, you all know how fortunate we are to have the fisheries that we have, whether you're fishing one of our legendary you know, three stone streams or just these wonderful tailwater trout that we have. It's, it's a special place. And I'm hopeful that um, you'll have the opportunity to, if you're new to the state, to sample all of these great fisheries. And if there's anything that I can do on my end to make your trip more successful, please don't hesitate to reach out. You know, if you need uh, help with fly selection or gear selection, or if you're looking for a guide or any of those kinds of things, I'm always willing to help. And I really do appreciate the opportunity to come this evening. Uh, brought a few books if anybody's interested, I'd be happy to sign one. And otherwise, but most importantly, here's my contact information. If I can help in any shape or form, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you very much. Anybody other questions? Uh, you guys are going to be yeah, good on the test. <laughs> Over here, Pat. Sir. Um, you know the details of uh, and why water management works so well. Right, right. 
Well, the question was about the Blue River and the, the overall health of uh, Cheeseman Canyon and the phenomenal job that Colorado Parks and Wildlife and Denver Water do um, with regard to that resource in comparison to the Blue River, which I think everybody, including myself, has a love hate relationship with the Blue River. Um, it, it's, but the biggest problem with the Blue River. Apparently, you know, when I've talked to John Newark, who's the biologist over there, it's just really a stale river. And the aquatic life suffers. Um, the, the flow fluctuates. It's either running at 50 CFS or 3,000 CFS. So I think really what needs to happen, and I'm certainly not an aquatic biologist or an expert on, on that subject, I think the, the biggest challenge there is it's really if that river flowed like two, two to 400 CFS, you know, year round, or you know, had a, a much more stable aquatic life, I think it would be so much better. Because I think we can all agree the Blue Rivers, it's one of the prettiest rivers in the state. You know, you get down and fish down around Palmer Gulch, and um, it's like a little miniature version of Jackson Hole down there. It's stunning, gorgeous. And what I can honestly say about the Blue, you know, I used to guide it a lot. It's not near the fishery that it once was, but there's still enough fish on the Blue River to keep it interesting. And I always figured it would just need one fish at a time. And I, I enjoy the overall experience, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be a big numbers game down there, that's for sure. But um, John Uward is the, the biologist on the Blue in the Colorado, and he's, he's probably going to provide you with the best insight and, and outlook on that. But I hope that helps. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You know, Waterton Canyon is, uh, I, I did a lot of fish. Any comments on Waterton Canyon um, was the question. And, and you know, I grew up fishing Waterton Canyon because I was born and raised in Littleton. And as much as my dad took me fishing, he took me a lot, but it wasn't enough. So the good thing was is that I could always ride my bike and go into Waterton Canyon and so on and so forth. Waterton has about uh, 4,400 or 4,500 fish per mile. So, you know, electroshocking data supports that it's a good fishery. The, the biggest problem with Waterton Canyon is the fish are small, and there's very few fish over 12 inches in there. Predominantly a brown trout fishery, at least the latest electroshocking data that I got from Colorado Parks and Wildlife. But there's almost as many fish per mile in Waterton as there is in Cheeseman Canyon. And they really look good. They're, they're harder to catch. People, um, Everybody that I talk to in Colorado Parks and Wildlife and would agree with you is everybody complains that they can't catch fish in Waterton Canyon, yet the electroshocking data shows different. And that's what's so crazy about that. But keep in mind, you are dealing with brown trout. Brown trout are a lot harder to catch than rainbow trout. So when you have a big biomass of brown trout, it could be a little bit challenging. Probably more than you wanted to know about Waterton, but I like Waterton a lot. How about the terriol? I love the Terriol Creek. Yeah, Terriol is one of my favorites. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, you know private access there. I'm fortunate that a friend of mine has a ranch out there, so I get to guide on the Terriol. Uh, but it's a uh, it's a special little tailwater, and um, I really enjoy it. Any other questions? Greatest thing about tonight's presentation is I get to sleep in my own bed. <laughs> <laughs> I have been traveling a lot. 10 weeks and I mean, living in hotel rooms and living on airplanes. So, uh, if you're home, I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> Sorry about all the glitches, kind of had me out of sorts there for a little bit, but I think we got back on track. And yeah, you know, Cutthroat Chapter is my home chapter. Proud to be a member of it. And thank you for coming out tonight.